Chapter 17 of My Bondage and My Freedom by Frederick Douglass, narrated by Grudgicator. The Last Flogging. List of chapter topics. A Sleepless Night. Return to Covey's. Pursued by Covey. The Chase Defeated. Vengeance Postponed. Musings in the Woods. The Alternative. Deplorable Spectacle. Night in the Woods. Expected Attack. Accosted by Sandy, a friend, not a hunter. Sandy's Hospitality. The Ash Cake Supper. The Interview with Sandy. His Advice. Sandy a Conjurer as well as a Christian. The Magic Root. Strange Meeting with Covey. His Manner. Covey's Sunday Face. Author's Defensive Resolve. The Fight. The Victory and Its Results. Sleep itself does not always come to the relief of the weary in body and the broken in spirit, especially when past troubles only foreshadow coming disasters. The last hope had been extinguished. My master, who I did not venture to hope would protect me as a man, had even now refused to protect me as his property and had cast me back, covered with reproaches and bruises, into the hands of a stranger to that mercy which was the soul of the religion he professed. May the reader never spend such a night as that allotted to me previous to the morning which was to herald my return to the den of horrors from which I had made a temporary escape. I remained all night, sleep I did not, at St. Michael's, and in the morning, Saturday, I started off, according to the order of Master Thomas, feeling that I had no friend on earth, and doubting if I had one in heaven. I reached Covey's about nine o'clock, and just as I stepped into the field, before I had reached the house, Covey, true to his snakish habits, darted out at me from a fence corner in which he had secreted himself for the purpose of securing me. He was amply provided with a cowskin and a rope, and he evidently intended to tie me up and to wreak his vengeance on me to the fullest extent. I should have been an easy prey had he succeeded in getting his hands upon me, for I had taken no refreshment since noon on Friday, and this, together with the pelting, excitement, and the loss of blood, had reduced my strength. I, however, darted back into the woods before the ferocious hound could get hold of me and buried myself in a thicket where he lost sight of me. The cornfield afforded me cover in getting to the woods, but for the tall corn, Covey would have overtaken me and made me his captive. He seemed very much chagrined that he did not catch me, and gave up the chase very reluctantly, for I could see his angry movements toward the house from which he had sallied on his foray. Well, now I am clear of Covey and of his wrathful lash for the present. I am in the wood, buried in its somber gloom, and hushed in its solemn silence, hid from all human eyes, shut in with nature and nature's God, and absent from all human contrivances. Here was a good place to pray, to pray for help, for deliverance, a prayer I had often made before. But how could I pray? Covey could pray. Captain Ald could pray. I would fain pray, but doubts, arising partly from my own neglect of the means of grace and partly from the sham religion which everywhere prevailed, cast in my mind a doubt upon all religion and led me to the conviction that prayers were unavailing and delusive, prevented my embracing the opportunity as a religious one. Life in itself had almost become burdensome to me. All my outward relations were against me. I must stay here and starve, I was already hungry, or go home to Covey's and have my flesh torn to pieces, and my spirit humbled under the cruel lash of Covey. This was the painful alternative presented to me. The day was long and irksome. My physical condition was deplorable. I was weak from the toils of the previous day and from the want of food and rest, 
and had been so little concerned about my appearance that I had not yet washed the blood from my garments. I was an object of horror even to myself. Life in Baltimore, when most oppressive, was a paradise to this. What had I done, what had my parents done, that such a life as this should be mine? That day in the woods I would have exchanged my manhood for the brutehood of an ox. Night came. I was still in the woods, unresolved what to do. Hunger had not yet pinched me to the point of going home, and I laid myself down in the leaves to rest, for I had been watching for hunters all day, but not being molested during the day, I expected no disturbance during the night. I had come to the conclusion that Covey relied upon hunger to drive me home, and in this I was quite correct. The facts showed me that he had made no effort to catch me since morning. During the night I heard the step of a man in the woods. He was coming toward the place where I lay. A person lying still has the advantage over one walking in the woods in the daytime, and this advantage is much greater at night. I was not able to engage in a physical struggle, and I had recourse to the common resort of the weak. I hid myself in the leaves to prevent discovery. But as the night rambler in the woods drew nearer, I found him to be a friend, not an enemy. It was a slave of Mr. William Grooms of Easton, a kind-hearted fellow named Sandy. Sandy lived with Mr. Kemp that year, about four miles from St. Michael's. He, like myself, had been hired out by the year, but, unlike myself, had not been hired out to be broken. Sandy was the husband of a free woman who lived in the lower part of Pot Pie Neck, and he was now on his way through the woods to see her and to spend the Sabbath with her. As soon as I had ascertained that the disturber of my solitude was not an enemy, but the good-hearted Sandy, a man as famous among the slaves of the neighborhood for his good nature as for his good sense, I came out from my hiding place and made myself known to him. I explained the circumstances of the past two days which had driven me to the woods, and he deeply compassionated my distress. It was a bold thing for him to shelter me, and I could not ask him to do so, for, had I been found in his hut, he would have suffered the penalty of thirty-nine lashes on his bare back, if not something worse. But Sandy was too generous to permit the fear of punishment to prevent his relieving a brother bondman from hunger and exposure, and therefore, on his own motion, I accompanied him to his home, or rather to the home of his wife, for the house and lot were hers. His wife was called up, for it was now about midnight, a fire was made, some Indian meal was soon mixed with salt and water, and an ash cake was baked in a hurry to relieve my hunger. Sandy's wife was not behind him in kindness. Both seemed to esteem it a privilege to succor me, for although I was hated by Covey and by my master, I was loved by the colored people, because they thought I was hated for my knowledge and persecuted because I was feared. I was the only slave now in that region who could read and write. There had been one other man belonging to Mr. Hugh Hamilton who could read. His name was Jim, but he, poor fellow, had, shortly after my coming into the neighborhood, been sold off to the far south. I saw Jim ironed in the cart to be carried to Easton for sale, pinioned like a yearling for the slaughter. My knowledge was now the pride of my brother slaves, and, no doubt, Sandy felt something of the general interest in me on that account. The supper was soon ready, and though I have feasted since with honorables, lord mayors, and aldermen over the sea, my supper on ash cake and cold water with Sandy was the meal of all my life most sweet to my taste, and now most vivid in my memory." Supper over, Sandy and I went into a discussion of what was possible for me under the perils and hardships which now overshadowed my path. The question was, must I go back to Covey, or must I now attempt to run away? 
Upon a careful survey, the latter was found to be impossible, for I was on a narrow neck of land, every avenue from which would bring me in sight of pursuers. There was the Chesapeake Bay to the right and Pot Pie River to the left, and St. Michael's and its neighborhood occupying the only space through which there was any retreat. I found Sandy an old advisor. He was not only a religious man, but he professed to believe in a system for which I have no name. He was a genuine African and had inherited some of the so-called magical powers said to be possessed by African and Eastern nations. He told me that he could help me, that in those very woods there was an herb, which in the morning might be found, possessing all the powers required for my protection. I put his thoughts in my own language, and that, if I would take his advice, he would procure me the root of the herb of which he spoke. He told me further that if I would take that root and wear it on my right side, it would be impossible for Covey to strike me a blow, that with this root about my person, no white man could whip me. He said he had carried it for years, and that he had fully tested its virtues. He had never received a blow from a slaveholder since he carried it, and he never expected to receive one, for he always meant to carry that root as a protection. He knew Covey well, for Mrs. Covey was the daughter of Mr. Kemp, and he, Sandy, had heard of the barbarous treatment to which I was subjected, and he wanted to do something for me. Now, all this talk about the root was to me very absurd and ridiculous, if not positively sinful. I at first rejected the idea that the simple carrying a root on my right side, a root, by the way, over which I walked every time I went into the woods, could possess any such magic power as he ascribed to it, and I was, therefore, not disposed to cumber my pocket with it. I had a positive aversion to all pretenders to divination. It was beneath one of my intelligence to countenance such dealings with the devil as this power implied. But with all my learning, it was really precious little, Sandy was more than a match for me. My book learning, he said, had not kept Covey off me, a powerful argument just then, and he entreated me with flashing eyes to try this, if it did me no good, it could do me no harm, and it would cost me nothing anyway. Sandy was so earnest and so confident of the good qualities of this weed that, to please him rather than from any conviction of its excellence, I was induced to take it. He had been to me the good Samaritan and had, almost providentially, found me and helped me when I could not help myself. How did I know but that the hand of the Lord was in it? With thoughts of this sort, I took the roots from Sandy and put them in my right-hand pocket. This was, of course, Sunday morning. Sandy now urged me to go home with all speed and to walk up bravely to the house, as though nothing had happened. I saw in Sandy too deep an insight into human nature, with all his superstition, not to have some respect for his advice, and perhaps, too, a slight gleam or shadow of his superstition had fallen upon me. At any rate, I started off toward Covey's, as directed by Sandy. Having, the previous night, poured my griefs into Sandy's ears and got him enlisted in my behalf, having made his wife a sharer in my sorrows, and having also become well refreshed by sleep and food, I moved off quite courageously toward the much-dreaded coveys. Singularly enough, just as I entered his yard gate, I met him and his wife, dressed in their Sunday best, looking as smiling as angels, on their way to church. The manner of Covey astonished me. There was something really benignant in his countenance. He spoke to me as never before, told me that the pigs had got into the lot and he wished me to drive them out, inquired how I was, and seemed an altered man. This extraordinary conduct of Covey, 
really made me begin to think that Sandy's herb had more virtue in it than I, in my pride, had been willing to allow, and, had the day been other than Sunday, I should have attributed Covey's altered manner solely to the magic power of the root. I suspected, however, that the Sabbath, and not the root, was the real explanation of Covey's manner. His religion hindered him from breaking the Sabbath, but not from breaking my skin. He had more respect for the day than for the man for whom the day was mercifully given, for while he would cut and slash my body during the week, he would not hesitate on Sunday to teach me the value of my soul or the way of life and salvation by Jesus Christ. All went well with me till Monday morning, and then, whether the root had lost its virtue or whether my tormentor had gone deeper into the black art than myself, as was sometimes said of him, or whether he had obtained a special indulgence for his faithful Sabbath day's worship, it is not necessary for me to know or to inform the reader. But this much I may say, the pious and benignant smile which graced Covey's face on Sunday wholly disappeared on Monday. Long before daylight, I was called up to go and feed, rub, and curry the horses. I obeyed the call, and I would have so obeyed it had it been made at an earlier hour, for I had brought my mind to a firm resolve during that Sunday's reflection, viz., to obey every order, however unreasonable, if it were possible, and, if Mr. Covey should then undertake to beat me, to defend and protect myself to the best of my ability. My religious views on the subject of resisting my master had suffered a serious shock by the savage persecution to which I had been subjected, and my hands were no longer tied by my religion. Master Thomas's indifference had severed the last link. I had now, to this extent, backslidden from this point in the slave's religious creed, and I soon had occasion to make my fallen state known to my Sunday pious brother, Covey. Whilst I was obeying his order to feed and get the horses ready for the field, and when in the act of going up to the stable loft for the purpose of throwing down some blades, Covey sneaked into the stable in his peculiar snake-like way, and seizing me suddenly by the leg, he brought me to the stable floor, giving my newly mended body a fearful jar. I now forgot my roots and remembered my pledge to stand up in my own defense. The brute was endeavoring skillfully to get a slip knot on my legs before I could draw up my feet. As soon as I found out what he was up to, I gave a sudden spring. My two days' rest had been of much service to me, and by that means, no doubt, he was able to bring me to the floor so heavily. He was defeated in his plan of tying me. While down, he seemed to think he had me very securely in his power. He little thought he was, as the rowdies say, in for a rough-and-tumble fight, but such was the fact. Whence came the daring spirit necessary to grapple with a man who, eight and forty hours before, could with his slightest word, have made me tremble like a leaf in a storm, I do not know. At any rate, I was resolved to fight, and, what was better still, I was actually hard at it. The fighting madness had come upon me, and I found my strong fingers firmly attached to the throat of my cowardly tormentor, as heedless of consequences at the moment as though we stood as equals before the law. The very color of the man was forgotten. I felt as supple as a cat and was ready for the snakish creature at every turn. Every blow of his was parried, though I dealt no blows in turn. I was strictly on the defensive, preventing him from injuring me rather than trying to injure him. I flung him on the ground several times when he meant to have hurled me there. I held him so firmly by the throat that his blood followed my nails. 
He held me and I held him. All was fair thus far and the contest was about equal. My resistance was entirely unexpected and Covey was taken all aback by it, for he trembled in every limb. Are you going to resist, you scoundrel? said he. To which I returned a polite, yes, sir, steadily gazing my interrogator in the eye to meet the first approach or dawning of the blow which I expected my answer would call forth. But the conflict did not long remain thus equal. Covey soon cried out lustily for help. Not that I was obtaining any marked advantage over him or was injuring him, but because he was gaining none over me and was not able, single-handed, to conquer me. He called for his cousin Hughes to come to his assistance, and now the scene was changed. I was compelled to give blows as well as to parry them, and since I was in any case to suffer for resistance, I felt, as the musty proverb goes, that I might as well be hanged for an old sheep as a lamb. I was still defensive toward Covey, but aggressive toward Hughes, and at the first approach of the latter, I dealt a blow in my desperation, which fairly sickened my youthful assailant. He went off, bending over with pain, and manifesting no disposition to come within my reach again. The poor fellow was in the act of trying to catch and tie my right hand, and while flattering himself with success, I gave him the kick which sent him staggering away in pain, at the same time that I held Covey with a firm hand. Taken completely by surprise, Covey seemed to have lost his usual strength and coolness. He was frightened, and stood puffing and blowing, seemingly unable to command words or blows. When he saw that poor Hughes was standing half-bent with pain, his courage quite gone, the cowardly tyrant asked if I meant to persist in my resistance. I told him I did mean to resist, come what might, that I had been by him treated like a brute during the last six months and that I should stand it no longer. With that, he gave me a shake and attempted to drag me toward a stick of wood that was lying just outside the stable door. He meant to knock me down with it, but... Just as he leaned over to get the stick, I seized him with both hands by the collar, and with a vigorous and sudden snatch, I brought my assailant harmlessly, his full length, on the not over-clean ground, for we were now in the cow yard. He had selected the place for the fight, and it was but right that he should have all the advantages of his own selection. By this time, Bill, the hired man, came home. He had been to Mr. Hemsley's to spend the Sunday with his nominal wife and was coming home on Monday morning to go to work. Covey and I had been skirmishing from before daybreak till now that the sun was almost shooting his beams over the eastern woods and we were still at it. I could not see where the matter was to terminate. He evidently was afraid to let me go lest I should again make off to the woods otherwise he would probably have obtained arms from the house to frighten me. Holding me, Covey called upon Bill for assistance. The scene here had something comic about it. Bill, who knew precisely what Covey wished him to do, affected ignorance and pretended he did not know what to do. "'What shall I do, Mr. Covey?' said Bill. "'Take hold of him! Take hold of him!' said Covey. With a toss of his head, peculiar to Bill, he said, Indeed, Mr. Covey, I want to go to work. This is your work, said Covey. Take hold of him. Bill replied with spirit, My master hired me here to work and not to help you whip Frederick. It was now my turn to speak. Bill, said I, don't put your hands on me. To which he replied, My God, Frederick, I ain't going to touch you. And Bill walked off leaving Covey and myself to settle our matters as best we might. But my present advantage was threatened when I saw Caroline, the slave woman of Covey, coming to the cow yard to milk, for she was a powerful woman 
and could have mastered me very easily, exhausted as I now was. As soon as she came into the yard, Covey attempted to rally her to his aid. Strangely, and I may add, fortunately, Caroline was in no humor to take a hand in any such sport. We were all in open rebellion that morning. Caroline answered the command of her master to take hold of me, precisely as Bill had answered, but in her it was at greater peril so to answer. She was the slave of Covey, and he could do what he pleased with her. It was not so with Bill, and Bill knew it. Samuel Harris, to whom Bill belonged, did not allow his slaves to be beaten unless they were guilty of some crime which the law would punish. But poor Caroline, like myself, was at the mercy of the merciless Covey, nor did she escape the dire effects of her refusal. He gave her several sharp blows. Covey at length, two hours had elapsed, gave up the contest. Letting me go, he said, puffing and blowing at a great rate, now, you scoundrel, go to your work. I would not have whipped you half so much as I have had you not resisted. The fact was, he had not whipped me at all. He had not, in all the scuffle, drawn a single drop of blood from me. I had drawn blood from him, and, even without this satisfaction, I should have been victorious, because my aim had not been to injure him, but to prevent his injuring me. During the whole six months that I lived with Covey after this transaction, he never laid on me the weight of his finger in anger. He would occasionally say he did not want to have to get hold of me again, a declaration which I had no difficulty in believing, and I had a secret feeling which answered, You need not wish to get hold of me again, for you will be likely to come off worse in a second fight than you did in the first. Well, my dear reader, this battle with Mr. Covey, undignified as it was, and as I fear my narration of it is, was the turning point in my life as a slave. It rekindled in my breast the smoldering embers of liberty. It brought up my Baltimore dreams and revived a sense of my own manhood. I was a changed being after that fight. I was nothing before. I was a man now. It recalled to life my crushed self-respect and my self-confidence, and inspired me with a renewed determination to be a free man. A man without force is without the essential dignity of humanity. Human nature is so constituted that it cannot honor a helpless man, although it can pity him, and even this it cannot do long if the signs of power do not arise. He only can understand the effect of this combat on my spirit, who has himself incurred something, hazarded something, in repelling the unjust and cruel aggressions of a tyrant. Covey was a tyrant, and a cowardly one withal. After resisting him, I felt as I had never felt before. It was a resurrection from the dark and pestiferous tomb of slavery to the heaven of comparative freedom. I was no longer a servile coward trembling under the frown of a brother worm of the dust, but my long cowed spirit was roused to an attitude of manly independence. I had reached the point at which I was not afraid to die. This spirit made me a free man in fact, while I remained a slave in form. When a slave cannot be flogged, he is more than half free. He has a domain as broad as his own manly heart to defend, and he is really a power on earth. While slaves prefer their lives with flogging to instant death, they will always find Christians enough, like unto Covey, to accommodate that preference. From this time, until that of my escape from slavery, I was never fairly whipped. Several attempts were made to whip me, but they were always unsuccessful. Bruises I did get, as I shall hereafter inform the reader, but the case I have been describing was the end of the brutification to which slavery had subjected me. 
The reader will be glad to know why, after I had so grievously offended Mr. Covey, he did not have me taken in hand by the authorities. Indeed, why the law of Maryland, which assigns hanging to the slave who resists his master, was not put in force against me. At any rate, why I was not taken up, as is usual in such cases, and publicly whipped, for an example to other slaves, and as a means of deterring me from committing the same offense again. I confess that the easy manner in which I got off was for a long time a surprise to me, and I cannot, even now, fully explain the cause. The only explanation I can venture to suggest is the fact that Covey was, probably, ashamed to have it known and confessed that he had been mastered by a boy of sixteen. Mr. Covey enjoyed the unbounded and very valuable reputation of being a first-rate overseer and negro-breaker. By means of this reputation, he was able to procure his hands for a very trifling compensation and with very great ease. His interest and his pride mutually suggested the wisdom of passing the matter by in silence. The story that he had undertaken to whip a lad and had been resisted was of itself sufficient to damage him, for his bearing should, in the estimation of slaveholders, be of that imperial order that should make such an occurrence impossible. I judge from these circumstances that Covey deemed it best to give me the go-by. It is, perhaps, not altogether creditable to my natural temper that, after this conflict with Mr. Covey, I did at times purposely aim to provoke him to an attack by refusing to keep with the other hands in the field, but I could never bully him to another battle. I had made up my mind to do him serious damage if he ever again attempted to lay violent hands on me. Quote, Hereditary bondmen, know ye not, who would be free, themselves must strike the blow? 